So I'm Craig Butts and I'm the uh, Professor of NMR Spectroscopy here at the University of Bristol. So you may not have encountered NMR Spectroscopy in your, uh, your education to date, but it's a key technique that's probably the most powerful uh, technique used by chemists to work out the structure of the molecules that they're dealing with. So here in Bristol we've got three, four hundred chemists upstairs making new molecules, isolating the next generation of medicines and drugs, and when they've done a chemical reaction, isolated the compound at the end, the first thing they need to know is that they've made the right stuff. They get a white crystalline powder and they want to know what it is. So they bring it down here to our NMR lab and they put it into the NMR spectrometer and it runs uh, a spectrum of the sample, gives them information about the structure of the molecule that they've made. So what I'm going to do now is just talk about how that works what an NMR spectrometer is and the kind of information that it gives you. So one of our chemists would uh, prepare an NMR sample. It looks something like this. So that's just a, uh, it's a slightly pink compound, this one. It's dissolved up in a solvent and they put it into this glass tube and then they load it onto the NMR spectrometer. So they simply place it into the robot, and then submit it on the computer and run an NMR spectrum. So when the sample's loaded onto the robot, it gets loaded into the NMR spectrometer, and this big can here is a magnet. It's a very large and strong superconducting magnet. So a superconducting magnet is one which is permanently at field. It permanently has a very strong magnetic field, and the wires that are inside it have absolutely no electrical resistance. So once we put a current into those wires and create the magnetic field, it will stay there forever. There's one problem with uh, superconducting magnets, and superconducting wires, is that they don't work at room temperature. They have to operate at around about absolute zero. In fact, inside this can, the wires are being cooled, they're bathed in liquid helium, which has a temperature of around about 2 Kelvin. So that's 2 degrees above absolute zero. On the Celsius scale, that's around about minus 271 degrees Celsius. So that's incredibly cold. So we have to fill these magnets with liquid helium, and then the, the helium slowly evaporates out of the magnet. And because the helium's so cold, if we just left it insulated against the room, it would evaporate in, in minutes. So we embed that bath of liquid helium inside another bath of liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen has a temperature of around about minus 190 degrees centigrade. So that's very cold relative to the world, but it's actually quite hot compared to the liquid helium. So the liquid helium and the liquid nitrogen are evaporating out of these magnets all the time, and they're incredibly expensive. We spend something like 50 to 100,000 pounds a year on the liquid helium that we need to fill all of the magnets in our NMR facility. Each of these NMR magnets alone costs something along the lines of about half a million pounds. We've got 12 here in the University of uh, Bristol, so that's, you can do the maths yourself, five, six, seven million pounds worth of NMR spectrometers. And we invest that amount of money in NMR because it's such a powerful and such a valuable technique for us as chemists. So the reason that we need these incredibly powerful superconducting magnets is that when we put a chemical sample inside the magnet, then some of the atoms, or in fact the nucleus of some of those atoms, line up with that magnetic field. There's a particular property that we call nuclear spin that some atoms or some nuclei have. And the ones that we particularly think about in, uh, in chemistry, and you're going to learn about in, uh, in chemistry at school, is hydrogen and carbon NMR. So hydrogen nuclei, and specifically the proton nucleus, so not other isotopes like deuterium or tritium, but the proton isotope of hydrogen has the property of nuclear spin. And basically it acts like a little bar magnet. It lines up with that large magnetic field that we put it inside. And in NMR spectroscopy, all we do is stack the hydrogen nuclei with radio frequency pulses, knock them out of alignment with the magnetic field, 
and then we listen to the signal as they relax and align back up with the field. What we're doing is putting them into a very high energy state, out of alignment with the field, and then they relax back into alignment with the magnetic field and release that energy. And we measure that energy as it gets released. I like to think of it as you take a human being sitting at the bottom of a hill, you give them a huge kick up to the top of the hill, they're in a very high energy state, and then you push them off a cliff and they scream and we listen to the scream as they fall to the ground. Perhaps not the best analogy, but it works very nicely. We can do that with hydrogen and we can do it with carbon. The key with NMR is that the frequency of the energy that they emit, basically the pitch of the scream, depends on the exact environment of the hydrogen that you're studying. So a hydrogen in an OH hydroxyl group will give a different energy and therefore a different signal in an NMR spectrum from a hydrogen on a methyl group or a hydrogen attached to benzene or a hydrogen of a CH2 group. So every single signal in an NMR spectrum, or sorry, every single hydrogen in a molecule will give a different signal in an NMR spectrum. And in NMR, it doesn't just tell us is it part of a CH3 or a CH2 or an OH, it also tells us what other atoms are nearby. So a hydrogen attached to a carbon with an oxygen on it will give a different signal to a hydrogen attached to a carbon with a nitrogen or a hydrogen attached to a carbon with another carbon on it. So every single chemical structure around that hydrogen will change the signal and we can use the signals that we measure to work out the exact chemical structure around that hydrogen atom and not just one hydrogen atom in the molecule but every single hydrogen atom. So NMR, once you know how to work through it, will actually tell you the entire chemical structure of a molecule from scratch. So when we want to run our NMR spectrum, it's really simple. All we need to do is come to the computer, tell the computer what the solvent is that our sample is dissolved up in. So in this case, it's dissolved in deuterated chloroform. And then what experiment we want to run. So a proton NMR spectrum or a hydrogen NMR, and then it calculates the experiment time and we push submit. It's as simple as that. So here we've got an NMR spectrum. In fact, at the top here, this is actually the NMR signal that the instrument measures, and that gets Fourier transformed, which is just a mathematical process, to turn it into the NMR spectrum that you'll learn about. In an NMR spectrum, we can see there are a series of signals. There's, in fact, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 signals in this NMR spectrum, and that tells us we've got 11 different types of protons or hydrogen in this NMR sample. One of them, this little spike down here, is the solvent. That's some residual protonated solvent that is remaining in the deuterated solvent that we added to our sample. The other 10 signals come from the compound that we dissolved up in that solvent. And what's really cool about NMR is every single one of these signals tells us a story. So for example, we've got four signals down this end, and those are hydrogens that are attached to benzene rings or aromatic rings. So I know I've got a benzene ring in the sample and it's got four hydrogens attached to it and therefore it's got two other things attached to it. And down here I've got six signals. Those are hydrogens attached to what we call sp3 hybridized carbon. And so that's hydrogens in alkyl groups um, typically. This really big one here that's a methyl group because you've got three hydrogens on the methyl group and they're all identical to each other. So they give this very strong signal. And then each of these others is a CH somewhere else in the molecule. So we've got one methyl, we've got five CHs there, and we've got a benzene group. And we can run other spectra like carbon NMR spectra that allow us to work out how many different kinds of carbon we've got in our molecule. And then we can use some really sophisticated techniques, multi-dimensional NMR spectroscopy, that not only tell us how many hydrogens and how many carbons and what kinds of hydrogen and carbon we've got, but 
which ones are attached to what. So which hydrogen is attached to which carbon, which carbon is next door to another carbon, which hydrogens are attached to that one, and so on and so on. At the end, NMR spectroscopy ultimately becomes the best game of nerd jigsaws you've ever played in your life. So we have a range of different NMR spectrometers here in, in Bristol, from small, what we call 300 megahertz NMR spectrometers, up to very large 700 megahertz NMR. The biggest NMR spectrometer in the world at the moment is a one gigahertz spectrometer in, uh, in France. And so as you go to larger magnetic fields, they become more expensive, but they give you a lot more capabilities. So we use our three and 400 megahertz systems, what we call our, or refer to as our bog standard NMR. Um, they only cost on the order of half a million pounds each. We use those for uh, chemical analysis. And then the larger instruments are used to study more complex molecules, usually biological molecules, proteins, things like that. Uh, and for those, the instruments can be one, two, and the one gigahertz uh, NMR spectrometer in, uh, in France costs around about 10 or 15 million pounds and about a million pounds a year to run. So it's a very, very expensive business we play here. But the benefit of that is that we can analyze and uh, work out the structure, work out the complete structure of very large, very complex biological molecules, proteins, proteins embedded into cells and, uh, get all the full detail of their structure and also how they move about in solution. One of the really neat things about working in a, in a chemistry department is that you get to use these instruments. In fact, all of our researchers here will come down and run NMR spectra on a daily basis. And if you do an undergraduate degree in chemistry, then you will also be able to come down and get to play with our NMR spectrometers if you're mad enough to work in my research group for your final year project, then we'll let you loose on somewhere between half and one million pounds worth of NMR spectrometers. So some of the, uh, some of the remarkable compounds that we've, we've dealt with here, we, we do everything from materials for uh, solar cells uh, through to the latest pharmaceuticals and drugs that are being developed in the School of Chemistry here, um, and we've even run samples for hospitals, for the police. We actually had um, the police come in with a vial of white powder that uh, came from a local hospital, actually, and it was uh, heroin. It was medical heroin, and they believed that somebody had taken the vial, broken it open, taken the heroin out, and replaced it with just some white talcum powder or something like that. So they wanted us to test what it was. So we took that sample, we put it into the NMR spectrometer and found that straight away it definitely wasn't heroin. In fact, it was an organic polymer that was used in shampoos, not something you want to be injecting into people. Like this. So in NMR spectroscopy with uh, hydrogen, I said that uh, we look at the proton isotope. In carbon, we look at the carbon-13 isotope. So the normal isotope of carbon is carbon-12. About 99% of all carbon is carbon-12. And 1% of carbon is carbon-13. And that's the active nucleus in NMR spectroscopy. And unfortunately, because it's only there in 1%, what we call 1% abundant, that means that the signals for carbon are about 100 times weaker than they are for hydrogen or proton in NMR spectroscopy. So in your uh, secondary school education, you're going to learn about hydrogen and carbon NMR, but that's by no means the limitation in, uh, in NMR spectroscopy. We can look at uh, boron, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, fluorine, phosphorus. There's about 100 elements that we can look at uh, by NMR spectroscopy. And so we do the whole range here. So I said that NMR magnets are expensive and uh, it costs a lot to keep them running. Even the solvent that we use in NMR is uh, extremely expensive. So when we run an NMR sample uh, and we're looking at, say, the hydrogen nucleus, because we've got so much solvent in our sample, we would see a massive signal from the hydrogen in our, in our solvent. 
So instead, we use a special kind of solvent where all of the hydrogen atoms are being replaced with deuterium isotopes. And that means we don't get any signal from the solvent in the NMR spectrum, but it also means that our typical solvents can range from around about 10 pence to about 10 pounds just for a single NMR sample. If you imagine that we run 50 to 100,000 NMR spectra a year here in Bristol, the prices can rack up pretty quickly.